Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to speak to the community that I um, so dearly, I guess, love and, uh, and, and uh, make artwork about. So I make artwork documentary exhibitions about the tech world. Um, and I, I've even made a documentary exhibition about uh, DLD once upon a time. Um, in the Kunstverein just down the road. Uh, yeah, uh, it seems like a long time ago now. But um, I'm here today to talk about uh, blockchain. Um, and blockchain's been mentioned a few times already in this, um, uh, in DLD this time. Um, but it's one of those words which, uh, which kind of like, it's hard to understand what it means for people who are not in technology. Um, it's like, uh, it's a technology which uh, people are pinning a lot of different hopes on top of. Um, yeah, but what I wanted to do when I made this uh, next piece of work that I'm going to show you is to kind of try and explain that to um, audiences which are not um, so engaged in tech and to try and look at three examples of three different companies who I think uh, represent somewhat of the spectrum of what's uh, politically and socially being kind of dreamed upon uh, in the blockchain space. I'm going to start with a video that I made about this. Um, it's only a couple minutes long, so yeah. Imagine a world where trust is guaranteed. A world without borders. A world in which each and every one of us takes part in the whole. This world is already here, embedded in the blockchain, waiting for its emergence. It consists of a network of decentralized, distributed, connected nodes that together keep our information safe and accurate. The blockchain was created as the collective database behind the cryptocurrency Bitcoin, but it can do much more than facilitate the exchange of digital money. Information stored in the blockchain is indestructible and incorruptible. Each node in its network automatically and continuously agrees with all other nodes about every record on the blockchain ledger to ensure that they are valid. Because each blockchain entry is programmable, any kind of activity can be stored and verified, not just money or exchange records. It could be a birth certificate, a contract, or even a vote. Information stored in the blockchain is public, transparent, meaning anyone can access it. Now let's take that one step further. For centuries, we have relied on trusted third parties to guarantee trade, a dependency that was born out of necessity. Every transaction on this planet is vouched for by overseeing actors like banks, states, or trade agreements. They provide a framework within which we can securely trade and share information. The blockchain, however, needs no overseeing third parties. Verification is automated in its code. A true reflection of all transactions is guaranteed in its very structure. There is real beauty in the liberal dream of a perfect market. A perfect information system reflecting the true data on exchanges between individuals, drawing a global map of the complexity of human relations. Top-down planning, even if it's well intended, can only misrepresent a system composed of so many individual interactions. Because centralized planning can never grasp the full and complex reality, it inescapably distorts and corrupts the truth. But the blockchain is the truth. It is a system enabling each and every one of us to take part in the real, vast, marvelous, ever-changing pattern of human interaction, governed only by ourselves enabled by a code belonging to all, reflecting all. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, wonderful. So that's my little piece of blockchain propaganda that I made. Um, uh, yeah, and here's an introduction to uh, the, oh, the, we've got the slides up there. Uh, the next uh, three, there's three companies that I looked at that kind of represent the spectrum of I think what's happening in uh, blockchain. And the first one is, um, is a company called Digital Asset. Um, its spokesperson and its CEO is uh, Blythe Masters. Um, now, uh, Digital Asset is a, is a company which probably a lot of you know um, in this community, but it's like, it's a traditional kind of banking uh, application to blockchain. So it's taking this disruptive technology and applying it to um, 
yeah, kind of traditional capital markets in a way that kind of preserves and consolidates uh, current market structures rather than um, suggesting an alternative. Um, so I made a, um, I made a kind of risk addition uh, ab about each of these companies, and this is the this is the uh, Blythe Masters uh, uh, risk edition. So it's um, it shows a board which um, kind of has a, a number of kind of uh, customized elements, um, kind of underpinning the story of of, of the politics behind uh, this company. So. Um, uh, as you know, on risk, uh, you have what's great is you have like a geographical representation of um, of the Earth um, and uh, of where we all live. Um, and in this one, uh, um, I've replaced uh, normal geography with uh, financial centres. So you can see like the entire um, of uh, Australia is Sydney, um, half of uh, Europe is, is London, um, and uh, yeah, this is to suggest the financial centres become more important um, in a context where uh, a digital asset um, takes over the blockchain space. Um, here's a little introduction um, I, uh, I wrote, um, which kind of uh, tells a story about these things. Um, I actually can't, can't read it, but uh, yeah, in risk capital markets, blockchain companies, um, yeah, you, uh, you bring computing and ent enterprise software companies into streamline uh, current IT systems. Oh, can I get a, a roving mic? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I can't read it. It's not big enough. Um, so it's, uh, it, yeah, in risk capital markets blockchain conquest, you battle cooperating enterprise software companies to streamline outdated IT systems, lay off bookkeepers, and provide the best blockchain technology solutions. The goal is simple. Conquer the world uh, one financial capital at a time until you're the only digital financial service provider left on the map. It's post-2008. The Feds are flooding uh, the financial sector with regulation, trying to make Wall Street, once the um, impenetrable back box transparent, growing capital requirements, um, clog financial institutions globally, all while digital trading expands the volume uh, transactions and acceleration of the frequency of trade. The bookkeepers sit sullen at their desks. The proverbial um, uh, bureaucrat realized paperwork stacked high in the in basket and low in the out basket. The banks of the world need an update. They need a blockchain revolution. Um, so that's kind of like a playful uh, look at um, a kind of gamified version of that world. Uh, and you have, you have the three players there. You have um, an individual banker, Blythe Masters. You have a kind of a um, uh, yeah, like a clearinghouse um, uh, regulation structure, like a central bank, and then you have a corporate tower. Those are the three players on that field. And uh, the dice, the attack and defense dice you have there are um, a fiat currency dice and a kind of a regulation dice. Uh, the second company I looked at is... Um, is a slightly different space. It's a, a company called 21, um, and uh, yeah, its spokesperson is uh, is Balaji. Um, uh, he's uh, yeah, he's a very well-known guy now, and he's uh, now being considered for the Trump uh, uh, administration, which says something about his politics. Um, and uh, yeah, his, his proposition, um, uh, or the way that I phrased it, is uh, is the potential for blockchain is to uh, make easily in, uh, monetizable infrastructure embedded throughout and in, in, indivisible from the internet. So the market becomes inseparable from communication in even a more intense way, and uh, a tech-led kind of post-national free market um, uh, emerges from uh, the world as we know it. Um, uh, this is his risk uh, edition, um, and uh, yeah, here instead of uh, a normal uh, world map, you get a kind of a um, an onshore-offshore situation, um, and instead of countries, you get market structures. Um, so uh, you have kind of finance. Uh, yeah, you have uh, yeah. Here we go. we have insurance onshore uh, turning into management risk offshore, uh, risk management offshore, um, hospitality and real estate turning into shelter. These markets transforming um, as you go offshore and you kind of build up uh, onto the cloud. So uh, there's not only a kind of a horizontal version of this, but also a, a vertical one where that where the cloud gets built in the offshore space. Um, and again, we have this little uh, kind of playful synopsis of the scenario. Uh, in risk tech venture blockchain conquest, the goal is simple. Colonize the cloud faster than, your companies, uh, than other companies with Silicon Valley solutions to outmoded sectors of life and economy. Once you've moved your tech ventures beyond nationalist borders, scale them to a mass market and be the first to build a self-sufficient society run entirely on the latest tech. In the current global climate, crisis is looming at every corner. We can vote, politicians can legislate, but the preeminent administrative system of our day offer change at a bureaucratic trickle. We need a better alternative. We need to stage an exit. Um, 
and then you get the different kind of players on there. Uh, you get an individual vision, visionary founder as your single player. You get uh, a Bitcoin computer, um, which uh, 21 is, uh, is tested and, and put out through the world. And then you get a decentralized network system um, uh, there as well. So those are your three uh, spaces. And, uh, and as DICE, attack and defense, you get a cryptocurrency die and a fiat currency die battling each other out. So um, it's the old money versus the new. Um, the third um, and yeah, kind of radically different company, I think, um, that I wanted to focus on is a company called Ethereum. Um, again, a lot of you in this community will know about it, but um, Vitalik, the founder, um, he's a very interesting uh, young uh, kind of hacker type um, who's uh, been going to blockchain meetups uh, forever. Um, and their vision is more um, some of the more idealistically charged ones that we've been hearing about um, earlier on in the kind of openness panel. He, he wants a more open, decentralized internet and a distributed governance infrastructure to build on top of the existing web. So it's about, yeah, re-decentralizing the web. Um, and the potential is to have a kind of incorruptible, open, global internet enabling decentralized alternatives for organizing the world. Um, uh, they're based in, in, in Switzerland, and this is their uh, risk addition. So again, uh, moving out of the planetary uh, kind of system into outer space, uh, a kind of radically new frontier. Um, and instead of uh, instead of the world map, you have yeah this kind of um, this intersecting uh, ideal um, of uh, of different kind of company spaces out in out in space. Um, your three uh, yeah, this is the introduction here is. Uh, uh, in risk crypto anarchist blockchain conquest, you compete against other libertarian crypto collectives to develop the most radically decentralized models of commerce and governance. The goal is simple, occupy all of the decentralized application nodes on the Ethereum blockchain platform before your competitors and watch the new world uh, form from the rubble of the old. Nations are built on the backs of the dispossessed. Banking systems are based on trust as flimsy as the bills they tender. There can also be no free market when uh, the conditions of freedom are devised by corporate collusion and state intervention. But thanks to the power of modern communication, we have the ability to create technologies that show us a way out of our current disarray into the future of distributed sovereignty and radical uh, self-determination. Welcome to the world of Web 3.0. Welcome to the Internet of Value. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's it's a kind of uh, a radically different libertarian view. And here we have, um, yeah, our kind of futurist warrior as the single player. Um, we have uh, a, a kind of an alien, which is the Reddit and the 4chan and the GitHub um, uh, logo all kind of jammed into one because those are kind of uh, platforms where, where this kind of world grows. And, um, and you have a kind of spaceship, a kind of ether-shaped spaceship um, as, your, as your big player there. Um, and attack and defense die, you have uh, a kind of like symbolic uh, a, a attack die, uh, which is a completely different shape. Um, and then the defense die being other cryptocurrencies. Um, I think uh, that's all I'm going to cover in my little introduction. But uh, yeah, that's uh, some of the work I've made about blockchain. I think we should, uh, we should use uh, the remaining time um, to talk about some of your many unrealized projects with, with tech. Um, when I asked you last time about it, we actually discussed a public sculpture you want to do with a Business Insider. I think um, it's somehow... That was before Matthias bought it, actually. That was, I wanted to do a, yeah, a downtown uh, uh, New York sculpture uh, for, uh, for Business Insider. But Can you tell us about that? How would it look? Well, it would, uh, it would be some kind of like um, collaboration with the content um, uh, that B Business Insider brings to a larger audience. Uh, Business Insider, to me, opened up a whole um, window of um, understanding and inclusion uh, into business uh, news. And I think... Uh, because business is such an important thing, um, I think more people should uh, look at it and understand it. And I think Business Insider is a platform that does that. Anyway, yeah. Any other examples for Unreal Dance projects? Well, yeah, it's actually one that we've been working on. So at the Serpentine Galleries, I did, uh, I did an exhibition with Hans Ulrich um, last year. Um, which looked at management structures and how um, like uh, hackers were kind of valorized in, in today's management structures. The and holacracy idea. The holacracy idea. Well, one of the things that I looked at was holacracy, which is a management structure, which again, some of you know a lot about, but it's kind of like a distributed management structure where all parts of the system are supposed to be equal. And um, one of the main companies using that is Zappos um, in, in Las Vegas. And uh, we had an amazing dialogue after the exhibition with Zappos. Uh, they got in touch with the Serpentine, um, said uh, I made a number of sculptures about their 
other company, um, sculptures of their headquarters uh, in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, they wanted to bring the show to Las Vegas. Um, and I went there on a little site visit uh, to visit them and talk to them about it. Um, and uh, I got uh, the, the, the building which they're in is kind of symbolically very interesting because um, it's the former headquarters of, um, of, of City Hall. So it's, it's actually a kind of a, it's a, it's a, relating to governance, it's a private company taking over the symbolic architecture of, of, of the former pu public governance. Um, and I got a great tour through the building and they kind of radically changed uh, a lot of the building's interior. Um, uh, they kind of start upified all the rooms. Um, but they they left one uh, room intact um, uh, from the former usage, and that was uh, the council chambers. So Zappos actually had their kind of meeting room where they decide important things and, and have talks in the former city council chambers. Um, they're also involved, and they bought a lot of land around uh, downtown Las Vegas, and they're kind of like doing city planning in a certain sense. So it's kind of a startup version of city planning. And what I propose to them is because they were um, dismantling this room, finally, uh, because Ironically, um, they found the, the interior design of the former um, city council to be too rigid for their, for their um, fluid startup-like meetings. Um, uh, that I wanted to kind of take the remnants of, uh, of the final piece of um, uh, public architecture out of there and kind of make a, make a sculpture for them um, in, in an adjacent space. Now, that got very, very close to happening, um, and then it didn't <laughs> in the end. And obviously, it's interesting because this Zappos model, uh, Tony Sier, the CEO, a friend of Steffi's, um, often talks about this idea that it's almost like, a, in Germany you would call it a, a Genossenschaft model of some sorts, because he's obviously managing the culture across his organization um, in a very horizontal way, and you're also very interested in this notion of the agile. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that, the well, agile? Ag agile is a, a kind of keystone of um, management structure as well that um, that I'm sure a lot of people in this uh, community know a lot about. It's like, a, yeah, it's, there's this kind of thing called Scrum, which is a process where you uh, a process whereby um, you use little stickies um, and whiteboards to kind of organize your time. Um, but Agile goes across uh, more things than that. I mean, I guess ultimate flexibility is something that is very valued uh, by this community, and I think that management structure kind of reflects that um, in it. But I think uh, the important thing to note about uh, what was uh, with, with the Zappos um, sculpture and with that whole show was this transition of governance and power from, um, from the hands of the state into the private enterprise. And I think in a, in a time of, um, uh, I think in a time where Trump uh, is, is being elected, um, uh, that's being done more and more. And I think, uh, I don't know, I think it's important um, for us to look very critically at, at what that kind of shift means. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes private interests don't do the best work. And, and, and I think public interests are very important to keep intact the state systems uh, that we have. Can you tell us about some of your other unrealized projects? Deep Mind is on your mind. Uh, yeah, I met uh, met the guy from Deep Mind last night. I would love to do a project about that because that's uh, ab about thinking um, as well. I did another. I'm working on a show in LA at the moment um, where I uh, wanted to do a kind of a, a transformation, uh, a kind of a yeah, something that documents the transformation of space again uh, from certain communities to other communities. Now, uh, Silicon Beach, as it's now known, um, uh, used to, uh, which is which is in Venice Beach in LA, uh, is a place where Snapchat and a bunch of other um, tech companies are. But uh, not so long ago, it was like a bohemian uh, kind of art artist center. Um, and I wanted to do an exhibition at the Hammer Museum, which focused on this transition. And um, I did a lot of research around that, and I vi I visited the headquarters of a company called Whisper, which have their was there in a building uh, that, is, uh, that was designed specifically as an artist studio. So I'm not going to name the name of the artist, but, um, that, but the, uh, yeah, the building was designed by him, um, and uh, he then died, and then uh, Whisper, this young tech company, kind of took over that space. Um, and they also kind of hung giant um, canvas printouts of their um, user interface all over the space. So in a way, uh, it was really like, um, uh, yeah, kind of tech business replaced the space of art in a certain sense, or transitioned from a certain uh, creative community into another creative community. Um, and I wanted to do a show which kind of overlaid the, tech, the canvases of, uh, of, the, of the tech company's uh, printout, of Whisper's printout, over the top of um, the work of this artist. Um, and uh, that wasn't possible because uh, the, uh, the artist's um, estate uh, disagreed with the idea. Uh, yeah. Last question. Uh, John Nash said last night that we face a crisis, how we define ourselves. No, if we look at 
all the things discussed, that there is a kind of a crisis, how we define ourselves. Would you, would you agree and how, what could you say about that? Well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that's a really uh, great thing. I think John's talking a lot about um, being identifiable and, and, and what, what makes a person and, and do we own our own data and things like that. Um, uh, I would say um, I think there's an identity crisis that I've come across. As I say, I've looked at this tech community for quite some time now. And one thing that I was always understanding was that a lot of people in the tech community were kind of libertarian. And that was like a, that was a, a space um, uh, that tech was kind of on the whole comfortable with. Um, but what I didn't realize is that uh, uh, some of the tech community were also very close to um, what is becoming the far right. And I thought um, that this is an interesting identity, self-identity thing, uh, which, uh, which was news to me in the last six months. Um, but as I said, uh, with people like Balaji being considered for Trump's um, administration and, and uh, people like Peter Thiel being in touch uh, very closely with that type of um, politics, I think uh, people in the tech community, um, yeah, uh, should think about what um, they want to identify with politically. Simon, thank you so, so much. Thank you.